Good evening and welcome to the David Rubenstein Distinguished Lecture today. We are thrilled to welcome you. Uh, I'm Judith Kelly, I'm the Dean of the Sanford School and thank you to all of you for coming out tonight for this important conversation with our Nobel Peace Laureate and international journalist, Maria Rissa. <laughs> the last time the Nobel Committee gave the Peace Prize to a journalist was in 1935 when it was given to a German journalist called Karl von Ossietzky who was at that time uh, languishing in a concentration camp. We're so glad that you can be with us here today and we're really looking forward to the conversation, Maria. Um, this lecture is generally supported uh, by David Rubenstein and we thank him for his long time engagement with the Sanford School and for creating this lecture. Um, also, a special thanks to our co-sponsors, the DeWitt Wallace Center for Media and Democracy, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year, which is also the same year that Duke is celebrating, of course, its centennial, and this is part of the centennial celebration for our university. Uh, it's also my pleasure to introduce uh, faculty member Stephen Buckley. Uh, Stephen is going to kick off the conversation for us, and he's the Eugene Patterson Professor of the Practice of Journalism and Public Policy in the Sanford School of Public Policy. So we're looking forward to a really engaging conversation, and I'll just turn it over to you, Stephen. Wonderful. Thank you, Judith. And thank you, Maria. Thanks so much for being here. It's a real pleasure. Uh, and, you know, as we, were, we began talking in the... Uh, in the green room downstairs, uh, we're just going to continue that conversation if that's so. If that's okay. No, I would so. love to. I love the mellifluous tone. <laughs> His great voice. <laughs> my my cheeks are the color of your jacket right now. <sighs> so let's talk about your Nobel Peace Prize. Why don't we start with that? Tell us about the. Tell us about the call. What was that like? Um, it was actually a, a strange moment, which then got captured because I was on a, on a webinar, on a Zoom call that was two hours long, um, asking whether or not independent media in Southeast Asia could survive. So there were three of us on the call, me from the Philippines, Stephen, who headed Malaysia Kini, he was from Malaysia, and then um, from Indonesia, Temple. Uh, and in the middle of this, after we finished the first hour, my cell phone was there and it started blinking. And I was like, oh, it's Norway. And I thought, oh my God, they're so kind. Because I knew that the, the announcement would happen and I knew I'd been nominated. But I thought that the Nobel Committee was so organized that they would let everyone else know who won the award before they publicly announced it. Um, so when I pick, I, I messaged and I, I told the anchor, you know, let me just pick up the phone, and I didn't expect the announce what what uh, what I was told, which was I think you could see this in the video. My face just like I I couldn't believe it, and I'm normally not at a loss for words. I was at a <laughs> loss for words, and then when it was happening, I started typing furiously for the sig on signal to my co-founders, because it was really. I cannot begin to tell you how bleak it was at that moment in time for Rappler. 2021. For independent media. At that point, I had, you know, I had had 11 criminal charges. I had 10 at that point. Um, and we didn't know whether every day in order to go to work, we, uh, there was a point when we had a lawyer there on standby just in case we were shut down that day, right? We lived with this tremendous uncertainty. Um, Olav Mjolstad was the guy who, who told me, and then when he said that, uh, almost immediately uh, they put me on live. And of course I didn't know what to say, so I kept saying, I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> well, so your, your life has really changed since, since then. Tell us, a, tell us a little bit about that. And actually, as you think about that question, I should say that I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask questions for about 30, 35 minutes, and then uh, I'm going to ask some questions that the audience uh, has, folks from the audience have submitted. So that'll be the second half of this. But 
Tell us a little bit about how your life changed after that. Uh, the four or five times. So in order to be here today, I have to ask courts for approval to travel, right? Because I, at that point in time, I had posted bail 10 times. And uh, in order to be able to leave the Philippines, uh, the courts have to approve it. And if one court of the 10 said no, then I couldn't leave. Uh, bef right before the Nobel announcement, I had been denied five times. So I was really starting to feel the walls closing in, um, but we kept doing our jobs, right? That was actually what kept us going. Uh, and post that, I think the first part was, oh, I was given approval to travel. And then the second thing, which was immediate that night, was a relief from journalists, not just from Rappler and Filipino journalists, but friends, journalist friends of mine from all over the world, right? Journalists don't like writing about themselves. And in fact, we've been trained not to, right? But we had gone through in the last decade before that really tremendous, you know, the harassment, the attacks, the jailing, yeah. killings. So, so let's, let's dial back a little bit. Tell us about Rappler, which is the news website that you co-founded, you're the CEO still. Uh, so tell, tell us why you created it, what is it, and why was the Filipino government so mad at you? <laughs> yeah, I don't know why they're mad at me. I'm a nice person, right? <laughs> like <laughs> You are a nice person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. Um, look, uh, I had been a broadcast journalist, so this is my 38th year as a journalist, but I had been with CNN for two decades. Um, 18 years exactly, I opened the Manila Bureau and then opened the Jakarta Bureau. I covered the transition of Southeast Asia from authoritarian one-man rule to the pendulum swinging towards democracy, right? And it started in the Philippines in 1986 with the People Power Revolt. I think what happened though was at a certain point after 18 years with CNN, and I'm sure you felt similarly, I was getting to a point where I would get in I would get a call in the middle of the night, you know, go to Pakistan, and then I would have to be at the airport in two hours, and then you land in Pakistan and you're doing a live shot. Right. And I think I felt like I wanted to build something of my own. So I went back to the Philippines. I headed the largest news organization. Leaving CNN was difficult, because that had been my life. Sure, you were there 20 years, you said. Yeah, and, but when I came home, I spent six years heading the largest news organization. Boy, that's when I really learned. When you're the news head of a thousand people news organization, then it's about culture, it's about setting standards and ethics, it's about all of the things that we are going through now. Around 2010, I felt a fundamental shift. And the news, the legacy news, wasn't shifting fast enough because digital, the internet was not giving enough revenues to justify the shift, right? And yet I felt that was gonna be the future, especially after the Arab Spring, right. which shortly became the Arab Winter, right? right. Um, so uh, in 2010, I decided, along with um, my co-managers, the four of us coming out of the largest network in the Philippines, we all resigned very amiably with our boss, and we started Rappler. We went from heading 1,000 people to 12 people, meaning you're your own PA, you're your own transcriber, you do everything, but it was all about mobile, all about, I, I drank the Kool-Aid, I believed in social media, right? Social media for social good, that was one of our things. So we created Rappler because um, I, not only did I feel social media, which is the distribution, was gonna fundamentally change everything, but the internet was, was going to kill traditional media. And then the last part is that uh, the Philippines has 110 million people. The median age is 23 years old. We're a young demographic and they were on social media. Right. So I wanted to adapt it, form and substance. So then comes 2016 and... Um... Ooh, you jumped through all the good years. <laughs> I did. <laughs> you did. Okay, did. fine. 2016. <laughs> and and so uh, President uh, Duterte is in power, yes. and you all start publishing some pieces that he and his administration don't like. 
Tell us about that. Yeah, so, so understand that because we lived on social media, uh, that we began to see the pattern faster. We were, we were among the first. And actually, if you look at it, information operations, which really began in 2014, right? Russia on mm -hmm. Crimea, the meta-narratives right. it used to annex Crimea, the same meta-narrative that Putin used to actually invade Ukraine itself. The same time that was happening, Marcos Jr. in 2014 was seeding meta-narratives that was turning the name Marcos from the kleptocrat who stole $10 billion in 1986 to the greatest leader the Philippines has ever known. So in 2016, that was the pivotal year when all those information operations changed people, right? And what happened then? Duterte was elected in May. About a month later, you had Brexit, and then all of the different elections, leading to the US elections in November, Macron in France in 2017 narrowly missed it because he went to Facebook to say there are these 30,000 fake accounts and you know Facebook took them down. If they did that in the Philippines, it might have been different. All right, so having said that, what did Duterte came in and like the strongman authoritarian rulers that have come in since 2016 in these elections, um, he started, he told me, I was one of the first four, he granted an interview to, and he said that he's going to rule the Philippines, he used these words, with fear and violence. And he did it with the drug war. Again, these are tactics. This man has been in power in Davao City, a city of, in the south of about a million people, on and off since 1988. So when we got to 2016, he began to, to the brutal drug war killed tens of thousands by their human rights count by the police. That number just keeps sliding backwards, right? January 2017, it was at 7,000. Then they slid it back in February to 2,000. What happened to the other 5,000? You know, this was our first um, casualty in our battle for facts. No one until today knows exactly how many have been killed in the drug war. Why did he target us? We weren't that special. We were third targeted. <laughs> I, mean, huh. uh, I mean, the first was the largest newspaper. Right. The owners actually announced within two weeks they would sell. Then they went after the largest broadcaster, my old network. Um, they took away the franchise of my, my former network. And then they came after Rappler. This was uh, 2017. 2016 was when information operations on social media began and I was getting an average of 90 hate messages per hour. Info ops, really, trying to tear down credibility, yeah? So um, let, yeah. Me, let me interrupt just quickly. So for our audience, you, so you keep using the phrase info ops. What do yeah. you, what do you let mean? Let me define it. Um, you'd like to think that you actually are in charge of your social media, of what you do on social media, but you're not in charge of what you see on social media. Right? And so the first is the design of the big tech companies first, first and foremost. We know that this is an MIT study from 2018, that they literally design it so lies spread six times faster because the goal is to keep you scrolling time on site. The more you keep scrolling, the more revenues come in, the more data they get on you, right? Because they use machine learning to build a model of you that knows you better than you know yourself because change the word model to clone, right? And then they use artificial intelligence to make that database used to micro-target you. So information operations is when that entire system that was initially used for profit, surveillance capitalism, a business model that was coined by uh, Shoshana Zuboff, 750-page uh, book. She calls it a doorstopper. You should read it cover to cover, <laughs> you know. But um, when she, when she, when we had the surveillance capitalism, what they forgot to tell you is that, you know, you're being manipulated. Then geopolitical power came in, and this is what we saw in the Philippines. 
Like I said, I'd been around a long time. People in the Philippines and Southeast Asia knew my reporting from CNN. And yet, in about six months, when I was being attacked constantly, 90 hate messages per hour, people began to think differently. You know, she's not a good journalist. She's corrupt. She's, it's that gaslighting that, you know, you American journalists also got to feel soon after we did. <laughs> so, so this is um, information operations is uh, the best example I can say, show you is, uh, again, Crimea or uh, information operations against Rappler. Uh, Rappler is, I, I'm both CIA and a communist. I don't know how, but... <laughs> You say the lie a million times, it's a fact, right? That's what social media has enabled. Yeah. So let's, keep, let's talk more about uh, big tech and democracy, because in your marvelous memoir, How to Stand Up to a Dictator... Thank you for reading. <laughs> um, you are really tough on, on Facebook. And in fact, you have said that uh, Mark Zuckerberg is... Uh, more dangerous dictator than Duterte. So what do you mean? Yeah. In, in the title, How to Stand Up to a Dictator, right, there are two I named. Duterte, because within six months, our institutions had collapsed. He was the most powerful leader the Philippines has ever had, and he didn't have to declare martial law. COVID did that for him. But even more powerful than Duterte is Mark Zuckerberg, right? The Philippines, up until 2021, spent six years in a row, Filipinos spent the most time online and on social media globally. 100% of Filipinos on the internet, so you're talking roughly 71 million Filipinos, are on Facebook. Facebook is our internet. You know, and let me not just single out Facebook. We're frenemies because Rappler is still a partner of Facebook. But it, it's the same whether it's Twitter, now called X, Facebook, now called Meta, and then you have YouTube for Google, right? Um, and search itself. This is how the content, I hate calling this content, journalism, gets distributed through tech. And if tech puts their thumbs on the scale, not because they want to elect anybody, but because they want to make more money in the process, insidiously manipulating at the cellular level of a democracy, then we have a problem. So one of the phrases that you use all the time is that as a result, we are, democracies are, are dying, uh, a death of a thousand cuts. What, say, say more about that. Well, that phrase comes from Al-Qaeda, right? Osama bin Laden, death of a thousand cuts. And it was initially, so I did counterterrorism. I, I did, my first book was on, on the Al-Qaeda network. It was a group called Jema Islamiyah, coming out of the Afghan training camp. So I used to track how the terrorists in our, in our region worked and then how the virulent ideology of Al-Qaeda spread and was, made was taken over by homegrown groups, right? The radicalization. So it's fascinating now to see that that kind of radicalization is happening in, in the political landscape, right? Um, <laughs> so I think the hard part in all of this is that what big tech has done for profit, because it A-B tests on each of us. So, Think about all of us as Pavlov's dogs in real time, right? And they'll test it, A, B, test it, plan A, plan B. But for example, one algorithm, how fr the friends of friends algorithm, it, I, I use this in the book. It's a growth algorithm that every social media platform uses because they found out that if they recommend friends of friends to you, you will click and befriend them and grow your social network in the process growing their platform. So friends of friends worked, but look at the polarization that happened because of that growth. In the Philippines in 2016, we didn't debate the facts. Alternate reality hadn't yet been invented by Kellyanne Conway, right? <laughs> so in the Philippines, we were all in the center, but after President Duterte was elected, if you were pro-Duterte, you moved further right. If you're anti-Duterte, you move further left. 
then this is 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. You add to that, right? Because they're so, we're so splintered far apart, um, it becomes more extremist at the edges. And the loudest voices, the top 6% at the edges, tend to take over the center of the information ecosystem. Then you add the radicalization that happens, because there are, there's nothing. It's like, well, you're all from Duke in a, in a football game. I mean, our politics is worse than athletics, right? It is a, when did politics become a gladiator's battle to the death? This should not be. That is what began death by a thousand cuts. Sorry, what a long way to get back to your question, yeah, but fine. you know, part of it is I, the easy answer, and I've said this so often, is you know, you will look away because you've got your life. But for me, it's like every cut, and they're small things. Uh, the government prevented my reporter from from coming to the palace. That's a big gash. But imagine that there's so many of these cuts to the body politic that you're bleeding out and you ultimately will die. Which means we also, that means we're also not aware necessarily. Yes, you think it's a paper cut, right. but it's actually bleeding out. I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's talk about the United States, right? When President Trump actually got on the call with, with Zelensky in Ukraine, and decided not to give him the money that Congress had already approved because he had a motive, right? I mean, this was the topic of a whole impeachment process. Right. And again, we go back to normalization of what wasn't normal in the past. This is death by a thousand cuts because in the end, look, our constitution and the, the Philippine constitution is patterned after the United States. It draws the line. It was very clearly drawn before. Norms had been set. And then what happened was with big tech, a bulldozer comes through and is trying to move it. That is the beginning of authoritarian rule. And what we did in the Philippines is I, I asked, Let's link hands, we hold still, we hold the line. We're not gonna voluntarily give up our rights. Well, you know, sometimes it come, doesn't come out well. I, I almost went to jail, <laughs> I mean, well I did for only a day or so. There are costs to doing that. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, Ooh. reporters, when, when we start our careers, we don't, we, we don't anticipate going to jail. What, Tell us about what that was like to be arrested and, and to be trying to run a news organization, news organization. while you're dealing with that. Um, I think that was when I realized that the world was upside down, when I was first arrested. I was already in my 50s when Duterte, when the social media attacks happened. So I, I had helped write four standards and ethics manuals for news organizations, right? So I, I knew we were doing the right thing. I didn't even think about it. and. Um, but yet that night I got arrested, and I remember it because it was the day before Valentine's Day. So it was February 13th, 2017, and uh, it was five o'clock at night, and I was actually, for the first time, meeting with Facebook's people inside who were looking at information operations. They had just flown in from Singapore. Uh, and all of a sudden we were in glass rooms, and then there was a commotion outside, my co-founder comes in and says, you know, Maria, they're here to arrest you. I look at my watch, and I, I knew at that point, right, uh, if you're walking in and out of conflict areas, I, I had already set out, when do courts close? Because I had been arrested. So when, when I knew that there was a 9 p.m. closing of a municipal court, so I thought I could post bail. I had an interview with, Prime Min, with Mahathir in Malaysia the next day. I was supposed to leave on a 6 a.m. flight. Anyway, um, yeah, I didn't make it. They delayed, delayed, delayed. I spent the night in jail uh, because they could. Um, and I think this is where I went to, to Hannah Arendt, you know, the banality of evil. evil. Because the guy who, a super nice guy who, who, who arrested me, he was reading me my Miranda rights, and then when he was walking me out, um, I didn't answer the media because I thought that I, 
who's been arrested, right? So, but he, he then said, Pasensya na lang po. Please be patient with me. I'm just doing my job. So I really, you know, our bureaucracies enable this. And you go back, and again, I can only always go back to, you guys remember um, in the Trump impeachment again? Sorry, this is so fresh because I'm reading through it. Vindman, Lieutenant General Vindman, right. who testified, did the right thing, but lost his job. The incentive structure is upside down. And that's when I began to realize we're going to have to, we're going to be tested. Yeah. We're going to have to come out. So let's let's talk a bit about journalism, which is in trouble. <laughs> okay. What's been the impact of big tech on journalism specifically? Oh my gosh. So I think two 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 major ones. The first, the easy one you may not hear about as often is um, on the business model of journalism on advertising. I run a news organization. I know exactly how much when we started and 90% of our revenues came from advertising to over the years watching that slope down because as early as 2016, 85% um, of advertising that used to go to media went to Facebook, Google, right? Went to big tech. So that's the first. Um, News organizations, um, this year, for example, you can see the bloodbath that's happened in American media. Um, so many journalists laid off in the Philippines. CNN Philippines just closed shop. 300 journalists are out of a job in the first month. So the business model. The second, the incentive structure. What spreads? What gets the widest distribution on social media? Right. Remember that news organizations, up until about 2014, were the gatekeepers to the public sphere. We were legally liable. So we were very careful about what we put in because you will get sued if your facts are wrong, right? And you don't want to, to do a correction. Um, Stephen, you know this. So what happened around 2014, big tech, social media became the gatekeeper. And I would say two groups abdicated responsibility for protecting the public sphere. Big tech, social media, and governments, right? Because governments had the ability to actually put guardrails in place for social media. What do I mean by that? And how does that impact journalism? The incentive structure of distribution, right? So we no longer, we can create great journalism but it's not gonna get to you because it's not gonna get on your feed unless it's incendiary. Lies, six times faster, spread six times faster. That's an MIT study. And then in our data, if you lace it with fear, anger, and hate, it spreads even more. Are you gonna do that as a journalist? No. So what happens for the digital groups that will chase virality on social media. It's not just the commodification of news, it is also the degradation of news, right? What gets the widest distribution? Crap. Yeah. Sorry. So, so <laughs> sorry. I was gonna say building on that, but that doesn't sound like the <laughs> no, <thing>. sorry. <laughs> um, but, but Rappler has, uh, has tried to address this in some really yeah. innovative ways. You've talked about creating communities of action. What, what's that? What are, what are communities of action? Yeah, yeah, this is the funnest part. So I sound all doom and gloom, right? But, but you know, um, pressure actually forces you to do better than you, than you think you can. Um, in 2012, when we started Rappler, I always felt that you know, a news organization doesn't have to have a marketing budget. Because I live in countries where law enforcement is weak, institutions are weak, and corruption is endemic. I hope this doesn't come to you here in the way that ours did. But um, anyway, so having said that, I, I took what would go to marketing and, and created a civic engagement arm. That is separate from the investigative journalists that we had. And the civic engagement arm literally 
went to schools, right? We started, because again, 23 years old is the median age in the Philippines at that point in time. And I felt social media, that, that we could actually organize ourselves on social media to demand better. The biggest problem in almost every government I had covered for CNN was actually follow the money. It's corruption. So what if all of us can actually work together? And, and we tried this in some of the elections that we had leading to 2010, right? Um, if there's a law in the Philippines, you're not supposed to use government vehicles to campaign. So someone took a photo of it. Or uh, the big one. Uh, These were regular folks? Just regular regular folks. So we started by training citizen journalists, standards and ethics of journalism, right? This was before the algorithms of, of social media really ramped up. That was when it was still a linear feed. There's a difference, right? You know that it is no longer a linear feed. And with the advent of TikTok, now you don't even get a choice anymore. By the way, when you don't have a choice, that means the machine is pulling all your data in. That's danger. So what you've done, can that be replicated oh, here? Yeah. So I think American journalists tend to feel, and this is kind of the way I felt when I was a parachute journalist walking into countries where I don't know you. I'm supposed to not care about you. I'm just supposed to come and see what the world is and then do the story, right? But that's not really what journalists do. Um, in the end, I, when I came home to the Philippines, I wanted to make a better world, and I wanted greater accountability for government. I also felt there was room to work with government. That was the civic engagement arm. And our first big civic engagement project was on climate change. We created a platform it was called Project Agos, because the Philippines by, at that point was the third most disaster prone country in the world. Uh, we have an average of 20 typhoons every year. And so literally we used our platform to crowdsource and create a map of the Philippines and we layered the data on it, showed you the path of the storm, uh, showed you landslide prone areas, flood prone areas and worked I had my civic engagement team inside the Office of Civil Defense while the investigative journalists were trying to get data, and we drew a line, right? Um, in Super Typhoon Haiyan in 2013, uh, the Department of Social Welfare Secretary, our investigative reporter running after her made her cry, but our civic engagement team was working with them. Why is that? I think America saw this with Katrina because you haven't felt these disasters. When I was heading ABS-CBN in the Philippines, our network, this is the largest network in the Philippines, we had a helicopter, we had two, which meant that my news organization can go into areas before government gets there. And one of the things I learned is you do not want to be sticking microphones in people's faces when they need food and water. So our helicopter that seated six people, we split it. Three people would be news gathering. That's a photographer, a camera, a reporter. And then the other three would come with relief goods. They were from our foundation. So when the chopper lands and we get there before government, both sides open. The line for food and water is here, and then the news gathering team can go. But you're not doing that now. Oh, you, that's you... ABS. Um, Rappler it has a foundation also but we don't have those kinds of resources. We don't have a chopper. I mean, but look. Uh, but, it's the, it's, but this sounds like it, it's doable. It's not just something that, that I think can be this done is the reality of journalism today, right? We build communities of action because what is the point of journalism? The point of journalism is not to convince you to vote for one or the other. The point of journalism is to pull us together, to go through the really difficult conversations a democracy needs, which requires not just saying, not just speaking, but listening. That's what I always look to America for, and I'm, please do not disappoint me. <laughs> so I'm gonna ask a couple, of, a couple more questions, and then we'll turn to, to questions from our audience. Gonna, let's play some word association. 
Uh-oh. <laughs> you, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out some names. You tell me what you think of in terms of technology or journalism or democracy and your thoughts on them. Sam Altman. Wow. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, you know, so we're partners with him, but Sam Altman. Uh, what's the thing when you begin war games? Uh, arms race. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find the word. Sam Altman releasing GPT-3 in November 2022 began an arms race. And the, we're trying it out in real time, right? Yeah. Uh, wow. Donald Trump. Oh, liar. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. That's that already. Was but okay. that was already. That's all right. Elon Musk. <laughs> Egotistical. Okay. Taylor Swift. Zeitgeist. <laughs> Zeitgeist. She captures it, right? <laughs> so uh, let, let's let's end on on in, ter in terms of my questions. Let's end on um, perhaps a more upbeat note. So you talk about education being a long-term solution. What, what do you mean? What does that look like? I've been thinking about this for a while, especially after the Nobel, you know, and then I'm looking at the lessons we've had from the Philippines. Um, because I think in 2016 to 2021, 2022, we were in hell, and now we're in purgatory. So there is a way out, right? This was supposed to be an upbeat question, <laughs> Maria. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> um, remind me again. <laughs> uh, Education is the long-term solution. I've watched history changed in front of our eyes. You know, in, in the book, I, I talk about Milan Kundera. He said, the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. And in the Philippines, we forgot in the same generation because of information operations. Um, America was targeted. The information warfare to target you hit the fracture lines of society. In the Philippines, it was kind of easier. It was the rich and the poor. Here, race, gender, um, economic classes. Uh, and I, I say that because I was in Richmond, Virginia, was it a year ago, where I seated the Confederacy, uh, I saw where the statues were, and I walked down the path where after George Floyd uh, was killed, the, the rioters came through, I looked at where they were, and then tore down the monuments to the Confederacy. We're in this massive, and this is enabled by the tech you're using, guys. You have to know what history is. And we're in the process of changing it with information warfare. So uh, I just spent some time in Berlin because I wanted to understand how Germany did it, right? It is the only country in the world that, that took responsibility for what it did and made every single person understand the scope of it. They, they use the hashtag never again. I'm not so sure with big tech that it will be never again because our memories, our minds, our emotions are being so insidiously manipulated. Oh my God, we have to end on a positive note. <laughs> Let's, what, what's the positive? Well, let, <laughs> let, me, let, let me ask some of the questions from the, the audience. Let's, let's do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, this is from Laura. Laura says, what are the best steps universities can take to protect journalists and independent journalism? Oh, my gosh. Well, you have a school of journalism here. Do not give up on journalism. Because I still think it is the first line of attack. And for the journalists who are there now, it is what we do today that matters. Right? I, this is the excitement. Here's the positive. <laughs> um, when Rappler, the first time the Philippine government tried to shut us down was in January 2018. I remember these dates, January 15, 2018. And that evening, after we did a press conference, I called a general assembly for about 120 of us in Rappler. 
and I explained to my team, the median age in Rappler is 23, it's very young, um, and I explained that th we were gonna walk into a more difficult position, and I was worried about what their parents would think, right? I, was, I know some of them were being asked to leave by their parents. Well, I told them, you know, don't worry, just tell us if you want to leave, and I'll, we'll help you find a job in another news organization. Not one journalist took that offer, not mm -hmm. one. And during the times when we were under the worst attack, it was the best of times for us because we were driven by the mission, the pure mission of journalism. So what can universities do? I think the first is please, I don't even know how to say know your history, understand how you're being manipulated. Pull out, look at the data, um, think slow, not fast. Daniel Kahneman's thinking slow, thinking fast are two systems of thinking. If you're fe feeling emotional, don't do anything on social media, but then more than that, study this time period because this is just like, if you watch Oppenheimer, <laughs> this is just like when, remember when he was, when, he, when they had that fear that if they started a chain reaction, that it could destroy the entire world. This is that moment. And what we do will determine the kind of world you're going to live in. So, yeah. Sorry. Okay, we're going to get to positive. I know, I know we will. I know we will, Maria. Uh, okay. I mean, the positive in that is that creative destruction. So I've just described all the destruction. Now we have to create, right? Okay. Okay. All right. Sorry. Arushi. No, you're fine. You're fine. Arushi wants to know, why are political efforts so weak in combating disinformation? It's a great question. I, wor I, wor I worry about that, America in particular, right? Because the EU has been so far ahead. The EU, which has come out with the Digital Services Act last year, I always said that the EU won the race of the turtles. Tra <laughs> traditional power has been super slow. Um, Part of it is because you can't see it. It's not like the atom bomb. In, in, the, in the Nobel lecture, I compared this moment to, to the atom bomb exploding, unseen, unheard in our information ecosystem. We are being changed, right? And geopolitical power can now come in at the cellular level of a democracy, each of us, and influence how we vote, right? And not in a small way like television used to. This is literally playing to the weaknesses of the scarcity brain, the way we've evolved. So um, it is changing you. Gen Z is very different from our generation. I hope, the hope is, and I think you are, I think you're more aware of this than our generation. Um, but I worry about your search for meaning I worry about values. Um, yeah, okay, I'm trying to be positive. Back to positive. <laughs> um, that means you can do something about it. I think maybe that's why I keep focusing, right? The hope is that you will be, the way I wrote the book is based on values, right? You have to draw the line where on this side you're good and when you cross, you're evil. It has to be that simple. Yeah. Uh, but in the book, you also say that legislation and policy are really important as, yeah. as midterm solutions, right? So, I mean, that's, that's it's, government. It's just been too slow, gotcha. right? And why is government, I mean, for American, um, why are the Americans so slow? Because some of your politicians exploit it really well. You know who I'm talking about. I mean, so the other part of it is Yeah, I, I guess in the Nobel lecture, I talked about how this can all be changed if you make tech companies both transparent and accountable. And a very simple policy shift is to revoke Section 230 of the 1996 Communications Decency Act. That is when you make these tech companies responsible for what is happening in the information ecosystem. Okay. 
Joe wants to know if you're ever afraid and how do you deal with your fear? Oh, yes, Joe, of course. Uh, I have, there are four of us who are co-founders of Rappler. So you have gallows humor, right? Um, uh, there's a point when I went to them and I said, you know, God, guys, it looks like I'm really going to jail. And so they said, they, they, they hugged me and then they said, wait, I'll bring sheets, I'll bring a fan, and I'll bring books. <laughs> you know, so I was like, okay. Um, no, but our, our agreement among the four of us, so we run Rappler, only one of us can be afraid at a time. <laughs> so you have to rotate the fear, right? <laughs> Jacinta says, in an age of bots and uh, AI, which can easily inflame conflicts, how can we refocus on AI's peace building possibilities? So much. Uh, OpenAI did a call for how they can, you can use large language models for democracy. And there, about a thousand groups answered that call. Rappler was one of those. So we were one of the 10 they selected, and they gave us access to the code to the LLM. And we actually showed how LLMs could be used for democratic consultations, right? That's an easy one. But look, I sound all negative on tech, but I love this stuff. We're building tech. And that's the other part, right? You should be building tech, because if you only leave it in Silicon Valley's hands and private companies whose only goal is profit, then we're missing something, right? Think about what LLMs can do, for example, for the medical field. Um, you can, you, actually, the LL, large language models can be able to do radiology far better than a human can, right? Because the patterns are the same. But we have to know which one it is. And I actually think there's a difference between a focused primary role for, for artificial intelligence versus artificial general intelligence, right? The difference of like throwing everything into the LLM. I mean, look at how many laws are being violated in how the LLMs were created. Did they ask to pay anyone for the copyright of what they've thrown into the LLMs? No. Right, that's why some news organizations are suing. The New York Times, yes, right? right? Um, yes. But I think this is it, it's creative destruction. Uh, there are positive things that we can do, but we also need to keep track of what we're losing along the way. I know you like ChatGPT or Claude or, you know, and that's also something else that education edu teachers are going to have to handle and deal with. I worry. Can I tell you my worry again? Of course you can. Please do not ask it to write you letters or to write the first part because part of the reason you do the writing, the really boring things, right? Like in the Washington Post, you'll first, when you're a new reporter, you're sent to the Metro beat. That's right. Because we send to the crime beat because you develop, it's like getting on the treadmill. You exercise certain things. And what I worry about is that the machine, which by the way, cannot create new knowledge. You will always need journalists in the moment, right? Because the machine will take what happened in the past and will find and, and kind of recut different parts of it. Neural networks will hallucinate, whatever, um, but it won't be able to move forward. That will be yours. And you do not want to lose the ability to write, to think, to find meaning. That is human. Well said. I think I'm angry. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, <clears throat> Asa wants to know, how do you attract readers to Rappler, particularly folks who, in terms of the, the, the brand, might automatically think, yeah, they, Rappler has nothing for me. Oh, how interesting. So do you go after an audience that, that doesn't like you or you don't think will be attracted to you? Yeah, I look at this differently because I see how big tech has actually polarized us, right? So 
Um, I've been in many meetings with news heads who'll say, how do we rebuild trust? What can we do when the distribution has already polarized our societies? Um, here's what we're doing in Rappler. Uh, let me tell you the next two years will be super difficult, will determine whether digital news will survive globally. Wow. Because there are only three ways that a digital news group gets traffic, gets you to come. Direct, which means you know and trust us, you come to us. Social or search, right? Those are the only ways. Beginning last year, Meta, the world's largest distributor of news, began choking traffic to news sites. Why? Because they don't want to be responsible. They don't want to deal with the difficulty of having facts inside the mix, right? So you are walking into elections where your access to news on social media is far less than it used to be. So we've seen in The Guardian, for example, they publish these numbers, I'll tweet it or exit <laughs> after. Um, uh, the Guardian lost more than 75% of its page views in the first six months of last year, right? The Western news organizations took the brunt of this. Um, Google uh, search, which is 60% of our traffic, 60 to 69% of Rappler's traffic comes from search. Uh, what happens when generative AI search doesn't, no longer puts a link back to the websites? Will we die? This is a debate that's ongoing with, they, they now call it SGE, Search General. You know, they have a new phrase, there are 125 countries that they're trying it out. But if, we, if our business doesn't survive, if you never see great, boring, factual-based journalism, right? And don't say that we, we should be trying to come to you in a TikTok way. We do that, but you really have to think we need to think. Thinking fast is great in emotions, and, you know, but in order to make a democracy work, there are compromises that happen, and you need to think. So, sorry, last, the quick answer to that question is we're building our own tech. Um, we decided, uh, I think this was my own distrust of big tech, because I really, really, I really believed in them. It's hard when you're so disillusioned. Um, but uh, December last year, the normal news feed of Rappler, we rolled out a new app that has on top of the news app a matrix protocol chat app. If you Google matrix protocol, you'll see this is like open, desegregated, secure. This is like Mastodon, but super e easy because it comes in a, it, coming through Rappler. And what we did here is, it's every choice I made with our tech guys, right, was always a choice between keeping the public sphere, meaning you are less engaged, or personalizing it so you get what you want, but you splinter the public sphere. Which choice would you make? The matrix protocol doesn't use algorithms to manipulate you, it is your choice. But the jury's still out whether it'll work. Do you want to be entertained to death? Sorry, not to lay it on you. Don't be entertained to death. Think slow. <laughs> I love this last question. Um, this is from Faith. Faith says, Faith. what's one piece of advice you'd give your undergraduate self? <laughs> uh, you know, I was pre-med. Uh, <laughs> um, I did my first two years. I finished all my pre-med requirements because that's what my parents wanted. And then my last two years, I switched to English and theater and dance. And then I applied to the six-year med programs in med school. Um, this was at Princeton? At Princeton, yeah. Uh, which was called the Duke of the North. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well played. <laughs> yes. um, I wouldn't change anything because in a weird way, that medical, the pre-med part, I, I covered the sarin gas attacks in Tokyo. I went to Matsumoto and I literally was putting the molecule together for the sarin. I, everyone thought I was super geeky, but you know, it's 
Do not follow what everyone tells you that you only have to become an expert in one thing. That in today's world, you are going to need to find boundary spanners that cut across. You know, you can't just be an engineer who knows how to build this. You need to cut across and understand how it'll affect people, how it'll affect society, how it'll affect our evolution as a species. So learn as much as you can. I, that, I've, always, I've always done that. Learn as much as you can. Um, and live a life of no regrets. Wonderful. Can we thank Maria? Thank you. Maria, I think I can speak for the audience when I say that although you delivered many messages that bordered on doom, <laughs> <laughs> and many pearls of wisdom, who you are and how you embody that effusive ebullience signals to all of us you know, your strength and gives, gives us a model for how to move in the world. So thank you so much. You'll be getting a, a link in your email, but you can give us some feedback. Um, don't go quite yet. Don't go quite yet. Because uh, I'm sure the audience will want to give you one last, last round of applause after I'm done with this. You get a link in your email where you can give us some feedback. You can go to Sanford's website to learn more about all the great things happening in the Sanford School. But please, before they sneak away a second time, please give Stephen and Maria a hand. Thank <laughs> you.